that the range could fan to 10%. So I bought this range hood, a house lane UCPS 18, a while back, and I've been pretty satisfied with how it works, uh, but it doesn't have any smart features. And every once in a while, I'll be in the middle of cooking and my hands are dirty or otherwise tied up, and I've wished I'd be able to activate the fans without having to manually press the buttons on the front panel. And so in this video, what I'm going to be doing is adding an ESP32C3 running ESP Home on it to enable control over Wi-Fi, including being able to use it with a voice assistant. So to begin, we're going to need to take apart the range hood to get access to the insides. And so after unplugging the range hood, you're going to start by removing the drip pan and the baffle filters. Then we'll take out the eight screws holding the fan cover and take off the fan cover and put that aside. After that, we'll remove the two screws holding the light assembly and remove that carefully. You got to be careful with this one because the lights are connected by cables to the range hood. So you're going to need to hold that up, you know, so it doesn't fall and, and tug on those cables and unclip those cables as you remove the light assembly. Then we're going to remove the two screws holding the front panel assembly into the front of the range hood. We're going to disconnect the cable uh, that connects it to the main board and then you're going to be able to carefully lift that out of the front of the range hood. The front panel control board is itself attached to the assembly by two smaller screws. These screws are different in size from all the other ones, so you're going to want to be careful about keeping track of these. They're also easy to lose, so make sure you put them somewhere safe. So taking a look at the inside, we can see that the buttons use capacitive spring touch sensors. And uh, in this one, we, we I've actually previously opened this up and soldered the wires onto the back of it with DuPont connectors. Um, they're attached to the connection points of the springs to the board. Um, as well as to the back of the ground and 5 volt connections on the cable that connects it to the main board on the range hood. So unlike with a traditional button where when you press the button it completes a circuit, in a capacitive touch sensor what we have is a sensor that is detecting the change in the capacitance and for this spring touch sensor that we have here, the spring that is going to be attached to ground and act as one of the halves of the capacitor and when your, your finger or whatever other body part gets close to the spring, uh, it increases the capacitance measured by the sensor, partly because your body acts as the second plate as the capacitor. And in a capacitor, as the plates get closer and closer together, the capacitance increases. So to test this out, I'm going to use some DuPont wires to momentarily connect the wires that I've already attached to the circuit board. Um, I'm going to plug in the male lead into the female connector of the wire connected to the ground, and then touch the male connector on the other end of the wire to the female connector of the power button to see if it registers as a button press of the power button. And as I'm doing this, we see that even though I'm not in contact with any of the conductive surfaces of the wire, um, my handling of the wires, even though I'm only touching the insulation of the wire or the plastic parts of the DuPont connectors, that's enough to trigger the buttons. So in order to properly test this out, I'm gonna have to use a non-conductive material to manipulate the wires at a distance. And so I got some non-metallic chopsticks because that's what I had conveniently in the kitchen. And we can see that when the wires are connected to the, the ground, when those touch the wire connected to the spring, shorting that, that spring capacitor, right? It registers as a touch of the button. So this concept does seem to work. Typically, the solution for switching one signal using another is a transistor. We can see that if we use a transistor, it doesn't actually register any of the button touches. And this happens because the transistors have current leakage, even when the signal is switched off and that throws off the capacitive sensor's ability to detect the changes in the capacitance. To solve this, what we can do is instead use an optocoupler, which completely isolates the switching signal and the signal being that being switched. And we're gonna connect the switching side to ground um, and a wire that I'm gonna touch to the five volt line that will activate the optocoupler. And then the side that's being switched is gonna be connected to a spring uh, on one end and ground on the other so that when the optocoupler is on, we will get a touch so now that we have our proof of concept, we're going to need to connect each of the buttons on the front panel to one of the optocoupler circuits. Um, I'm going to solder five optocoupler circuits onto uh, the skinny prototype board that fits in the gap in the front panel assembly under the, the front panel PCB. And each is going to be connected to a GPIO pin on ESP32C3 microcontroller on the switching side and a male header on the side that's being switched to connect to the wires I previously attached to the back of the, the front panel control board. We're gonna also wire up some headers that will attach to the five volt and ground on the front panel to provide power for the ESP board so that we don't have to have a separate power supply. 
And one caution here is to avoid using any of the GPIO pins that are strapping pins. Uh, that includes GPIO2 on the ESP32 C3 model, as when I tried to use that one, it seemed to cause issues with the buttons on the front panel becoming uh, un unresponsive. After connecting all the wires on the board uh, that I just made, the first thing we can do is make sure that the buttons can still be activated by touch, by touching the springs. And this is important to me when adding remote control to a device that it actually remains usable as a normal device, right? So a person should be able to come up to the device unaware that there are any modifications and use it as if it has been completely unmodified. Once we have that verified, uh, we're gonna go into ESP Home and set up some simple switches for the GPIO pins to make sure that the microcontroller that we added is able to trigger the buttons. After building and uploading the firmware to the ESP32C3, it's time to connect it to Home Assistant and test if the buttons can be triggered remotely. And luckily it looks like we have success here. This brings us to the final and trickiest part of this whole endeavor. So at this point we can successfully push the buttons remotely, but if we want to have effective remote control, what we need is to know the current state of the device. So for example, if I want to set the fan to half speed, right, the microcontroller needs to know if the range hood is already on or not to decide whether it needs to press the power button. If it presses the power button when the fan is already on, it's gonna turn it off, which is definitely not what we want. We also need to know whether the, the speed needs to be increased or decreased, right, and how many times we need to heat, hit each of those buttons to get to a 50% speed. So what we're gonna to need to do is we see that this cable from the range hood that connects to the front panel has three wires. It has a five volt connection, a ground connection that are labeled. And so we're gonna tap into this, see if we can get any useful information. Um, we can also guess that this signal is probably gonna be at five volts uh, while the ESP32, um, it uses logic at 3.3 volts. So we're gonna use a, a PMP transistor here to read the signal to make sure that we don't overload the GPIO pins. So after we've connected the range hood signal to the ESP32 through a transistor, we're gonna add a UART reader to see what signals we can read. Um, since I don't have any fancy equipment or a logic analyzer or an oscilloscope or anything like that, we're gonna have to guess the baud rate until I can get a clear signal that I use. Um, so I, I tried a bunch of UART baud rates that are, are commonly used um, and eventually started to get some output at 19,200 baud's um, and 9,600 baud's. But these were just repeated strings of F0 every second or half second or so. And at 4,800 baud's, I was finally getting a mix of FE and F0 characters, but they were pretty inconsistent. Going to even lower baud rates, I had more success with the repeated message seemingly changing when the fan speed changed or the light was turned on or off. So we were getting some sort of state information here. But at 2,400 and 1,800 baud's, those meshes would sometimes be different even if the state of the fan and light weren't changed. So each of those differences were actually a single bit flip. And so we were getting some inconsistent reading of the bits. So I tried 3,600 baud's, which is not really a common baud rate, um, but I was getting consistent messages and the messages were also different for each state of the fan and the light. I can see that the same string was being repeated over and over and over again. So the, the front panel is basically constantly sending signal to the main board, telling it what speed, uh, what speed the fan should run at and whether the light should be on. I can see also that each of the strings was repeated with the, the same five bytes at the beginning and the same four bytes at the end of the string. And then anywhere between seven to 13 bytes in between. There didn't seem to be any consistent patterns to the encoding of the fan and light speed. So what I really suspect is that this protocol isn't UART um, and some bits that are, that are lost that aren't being recorded because they don't fit UART protocol. And so that's because a UART frame has a specific start and end sequence with eight bits of content switched be, switch between those uh, start and end bits. And if uh, a sequence of high and low signals doesn't match exactly that frame format, it's not actually gonna be read by this UART detector. So what I suspect is that, you know, at this baud rate, I'm happening to get just enough of the signals to fit this UART signal frame uh, format. And so I'm able to read that, but um, you know the, the signal probably should be properly decoded using some other uh, protocol. That being said, I didn't actually need to be able to decode the entire protocol, right? So I don't need to be able to send a message to the main board. All I really need is to be able to determine what speed the fan is at right now, as well as whether the light is on or off. And so I was able to program an ESPM component with this information that looks for that message start string and keeps reading until it gets to the message end string and then takes that 
message in between, the data in between, and then I hard coded uh, each of the messages that I was able to find for each of the states to the corresponding state. And then that will then tell the ESP home component whether the light is on and what speed the fan is on at. Then I can then program whenever I want to adjust the speed or adjust the light. It will then know exactly which buttons to press and how many times to press each button. The end result is complete control of the range hood using Home Assistant. Uh, in my case, uh, my Google speakers are connected to Home Assistant. So that includes voice control. So I have now touchless control of the range hood. If you're interested in doing something like this, whether you have the same model or whether you want to try to see if you can do it to a different model, I've put a link to the code for this uh, ESP Home component in the description.